Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Asher. How common is esophageal gastric duodenal Crohn's disease? The best data from North America comes from this large NIDDK consortium that was actually developed to study genetics and phenotype of patients with Crohn's disease. But they amassed about 2,000 patients that they then subphenotyped into what location of Crohn's disease they had. If you divide patients into who had L4 disease, which is what we considered upper GI Crohn's disease, that was about 16% of the 2,000. Of these, 8% had esophageal, gastric, or duodenal Crohn's disease. So if you look at the overall denominator of over 2,000, it's about 175 will have esophageal, gastric, or duodenal involvement. But the vast majority of them will also have concurrent involvement in the colon or small intestine. If you look at isolated esophageal, gastric, or duodenal Crohn's disease, that was 19 out of 2,000, which is about 1%. And that's the 1% I'm here to talk about. They also separated out those who had this esophageal gastric duodenal Crohn's disease from those who had Crohn's disease that we see more commonly in the ileum and colon. There are some interesting differences between the two. Patients who had esophageal gastric or duodenal Crohn's were likely to be diagnosed at a much younger age. You see here about 20 years for the EGD Crohn's and about 26 years for those who had non upper GI Crohn's, they were also more likely to have B1 disease compared to those who had Crohn's elsewhere, which is the non-penetrating, non-structuring phenotype. If you break down the different subtypes of esophageal, gastric, or duodenal Crohn's disease, let's start at the top, so esophageal Crohn's disease. Of the uncommon sites, this is really the site where isolated involvement is least common. If you look at adult cohorts, about 1.2 to 1.8% will have esophageal involvement. If you look at children, again, studies have differed in how they defined esophageal involvement, whether there was endoscopic lesions, whether there was histologic activity alone. The children, it seems to be more common between 8 and 18%. In some series, as high as 42%, though we clearly don't see that high numbers in clinical practice. There are a number of symptoms that are common to patients with esophageal Crohn's disease. The problem is it's very difficult to distinguish symptoms for this from other more common causes of the same symptoms in someone who has Crohn's disease elsewhere. About half, 55% in many case series, presented with dysphagia. About 40% will present with odinophagia, so pain while swallowing. 33% will have sort of nonspecific epigastric pain. In some, it can present as just refractory heartburn, so a quarter to 30%. And in some, it can present as non-cardiac chest pain. So somebody with Crohn's disease elsewhere, complaining of persistent chest pain, you don't have a clear explanation, may be worth looking in their esophagus to see if there's a contribution from there. The most common location of involvement in esophageal Crohn's disease is either in the distal third or mid-esophagus. In the limited data there is available, over 50% of patients with esophageal Crohn's will have involvement at one of those two sites. Isolated proximal esophageal involvement is less common, 4%, whereas diffuse panesophageal involvement was seen in just under a quarter of patients in this series. There are two small series published from the Mayo Clinic separated by about five years that looked at different endoscopic appearances in patients with esophageal Crohn's disease. About half the patients had either superficial ulcerations or just erythema and erosions in the esophagus. But also important, about one-fifth in both series presented with either strictures in the esophagus and in some cases, fistulas, and in some cases, tracheoesophageal fistulas as well. These are pictures courtesy of my colleagues in the pediatric GI department at MGH. You see the different ways in which esophageal Crohn's can present. In one, you see more linear ulcers. In the other one, you see more punched out ulcers with some narrowing and um, a reduced caliber of the esophagus. These are additional images, one looking at a possible site of fistula in someone with esophageal Crohn's disease, and in the other picture, more discrete aftosulcer-like lesions in the esophagus. Moving a little further down the GI tract to the stomach, symptomatic gastroduodenal Crohn's disease is about 2 to 5%, so a shade more common than esophageal Crohn's disease. But if you look at histologic involvement, that seems to be far more common. 
So this series looked at about 800 patients with Crohn's disease who had an upper endoscopy and biopsied the stomach in everybody and saw that focal gastritis in the antrum could be present in as many as 40% of patients with Crohn's disease, many of whom did not have macroscopic lesions, and about 4% of these patients actually had granulomas in their stomach. Focal gastritis in the body may also be seen in about 37% of patients, 5% with granulomas. For the purpose of this talk, we're dealing primarily with people who have endoscopic lesions at these sites and not with those with just isolated histologic involvement. In the same study, when they biopsied the duodenum, 12% showed some histologic abnormality of whom the vast majority in this series had granulomas. This has been debated in the literature, and not all studies have shown a similarly high rate of involvement. Nonspecific duodenitis was very common in about 24%, and only about half the patients with Crohn's disease who did not have macroscopic lesions actually had normal duodenum on histology. The symptoms of gastric Crohn's disease, as you may expect, are similarly nonspecific as we also see in esophageal Crohn's, epigastric pain, nausea, emesis, weight loss, upper GI bleeding. There are rare case reports of pancreatitis from duodenal Crohn's if you have an involvement in the second part of the, of the pancreas. You'll also frequently see on imaging when patients have penetrating Crohn's disease elsewhere, either in the ileum or more commonly in the transverse colon, you may see reports of a possible duodenal fistula. These very rarely represent primary duodenal pathologies, and they're usually starting from the inflamed small intestine or colon. Endoscopic features of gastric Crohn's disease, you can see irregularly shaped ulcers, abscess ulcers, linear ulcers, cobble stoning, you can read the list there. Sometimes it presents as just a non-distensible stomach, or you see a thickening of narrowing of the antrum without clear endoscopic mucosal disruption. And sometimes in the duodenum, you can see either notching of the folds or duodenal strictures. See, I'm having some difficulty advancing the slide, okay? So these are images of gastric Crohn's disease, again, courtesy of some of my pediatric GI colleagues. Again, just going to highlight that these are far more common problems in children than actually in adults. You see one image there right at the top with a punched out lesion in the antrum from gastric Crohn's disease, and other times you see just small aphthae or focal areas of erythema. These are patients with duodenal Crohn's disease where you see this web-like ulcers in the duodenal bulb leading to a post-ulceration narrowing at the junction of the first and the second part of the duodenum. So how do you treat esophageal, gastric, or duodenal Crohn's disease? So clearly there are no randomized controlled trials looking at efficacy of specific agents in this very, very rare phenotype. But broadly, and there's no reason to think that it should be otherwise, that medical treatment of Crohn's disease at these sites is very similar to that at other parts of the gut. Again, very, very small series of patients, both from the Mayo Clinic. Some patients received immunomodulated therapy and did better. Some received infliximab therapy and did better. And some actually received a combination therapy with infliximab and tacrolimus in this particular case where there was a fistula to the airway, and that actually improved as well. Some received topical budesonide therapy, and this is important to keep in mind that capsules were opened up similar to what we do for eosinophilic esophagitis for it to be effective in the esophagus. The ECHO consensus guidelines from two years ago suggest that maybe mild esophageal or gastroduodenal Crohn's can be treated with acid inhibition alone with a PPI, but more severe or refractory disease requires additional systemic steroids or anti-TNF-based therapy. What's also important to recognize is that many of these patients can present with symptomatic strictures, and the problem is unlike in the small intestine or the colon, surgical treatment for these strictures is very challenging given the location of involvement. And so often, endoscopic dilation is the therapy of choice for stricturing upper GI Crohn's. If you look at this patient of mine, who's a 26-year-old male who initially presented with symptoms of gastric outlet obstruction. He had no lower GI symptoms, no diarrhea, but presented primarily with weight loss, postprandial vomiting, abdominal pain, and distension. We ended up we ended up doing an upper endoscopy, and we saw this really, really tight structure in the duodenum that could not be traversed. You see really this pinhole. We then started him on treatment with prednisone, and in 
and put him on treatment with adalimumab at the standard induction dose. We scoped him again three months later. You still see some active inflammation at that site. The narrowing is a little better than it had been before, but still very narrow and we're not able to get through. We continued him on treatment, and this is him one year after starting adalimumab therapy. Again, this was a primarily an inflammatory stricture that did not need endoscopic therapy, but you can at least start seeing through the stricture now. And finally, after two years of treatment, we're actually able to get through and reach the distal, distal duodenum, and he's done very well in terms of his symptoms from three months after treatment. As I said, endoscopic treatment is important in managing upper GI structures, but there are some favorable profiles that respond better to endoscopic dilation. Predominantly fibrotic stricture, a short stricture defined as something that's less than four centimeters, a benign stricture clearly, having a straight bowel lumen, and a stricture far away from a fistula orifice. All of these portend well for efficacy of endoscopic dilation. On the other hand, when not to dilate or where dilation may be less efficacious is if the stricture is predominantly inflammatory, if the stricture is long, obviously for a malignant stricture. The stricture is very angulated, it's very difficult to get effective dilation at the site, and clearly strictures associated with fistulas or abscesses, you need to be very, very, very careful if you're even thinking about dilation. How effective is dilation? There are very small series from multiple centers looking at how effective dilation is specifically for upper GI Crohn's. There's obviously a lot more data on how effective dilation is for colonic or ileal disease if you look specifically at just upper GI strictures. In this small single center cohort of 35 patients, most of whom had duodenal strictures, some with gastric strictures, the mean duration of Crohn's disease of 80 months before they actually underwent dilation. It's important to draw your attention to the fact that nearly one-third of patients needed more than four dilations. So that's something that's important for us to keep in mind in terms of what expectations there are. And it's also something to convey to your patients that usually strictures for upper GI Crohn's disease, it's not a one-and-done ap approach to it. endoscopic balloon dilation. It's something that frequently requires multiple attempts. This is a breakdown of the characteristics of the patients in that study, separated out by whether it was a gastric stricture or a duodenal stricture. Some patients had presynodic dilation, about one-third, but 50% still had abnormal mucosa at the time of dilation. So often when we're evaluating these patients, you see some erosions or ulcerations at the stricture site that did not keep the dilation from happening. And in only about three quarters of patients with gastric strictures and fewer than half of duodenal strictures was the endoscopist actually able to get beyond the stricture before dilation. The most common method of dilation that they use, and this is something I do in my practice as well, is to use the CRE balloon. 100% of strictures at both sides were dilated using that to a maximum diameter of 20 millimeters for the stomach and 15 millimeters for the duodenum. Very rarely do people do steroid injections. Fluoroscopy is needed in about one-fifth. Obviously, if you're not able to get good traversing the stricture, you may need fluoroscopy with a wire to make sure you're able to actually get past it. The vast majority of patients are able to achieve some dilation, so 93% technical success rate. The clinical efficacy is a little less, so about 85 to 88% have some symptom benefit. However, what is important to remember is that over 50% will have symptom recurrence, and if you look at the months to symptom recurrence, that's one to two months. So with just one dilation, you have to expect that symptoms will recur fairly soon after dilation, and many will require redilation, and you see here when, that, when that's happened in these studies. A longer time from stricture diagnosis to dilation, and the more open you can get it with the balloon, the better it is in terms of clinical efficacy. On the other hand, if they have penetrating disease, that means that they are likely to require surgery in spite of your endoscopic dilation. This was a larger series from, from, from multiple centers looking at about 100 patients with gastric and duodenal Crohn's disease. You see something very similar to what you observed in the smaller case series, that in the vast majority, you're able to achieve technical success in dilating the strictures. Obviously, it's a very selected population that, that is included in this court. Relief of symptoms, there is in 
about 80, 85%, but there's significant symptom recurrence. If you look at symptom recurrence, need for real dilation, or need for surgical intervention at six, 12, and 24 months, you see sort of this unfortunate climbing up of the proportions, nearly 78% had symptom recurrence two years after dilation. So it's really not a one and done kind of deal. There are obviously surgical treatments, particularly for gastric outlet obstruction. You can do a gastrojejunostomy, you can do a strictureplasty. There is risk of recurrence, marginal ulcerations, and recurrent obstruction even with surgical sites. Obviously for esophageal strictures, it becomes much more difficult to do surgical treatment. These are some videos of just dilation. I think many of us are familiar with the broad principles of dilation. This is a patient of mine with esophageal Crohn's disease who sort of had this narrow caliber esophagus up the up her entire esophagus, but I felt that the dominant culprit was this narrowing in the upper esophagus. If you could play the video, please. So here I'm getting past it. I'm opening the CRE balloon. In this case, this was to about 12 millimeters. I make sure that I don't get pulled in. These are all very common endoscopic principles that we are, we're generally aware of. And it's important to hold it for about, my practice for at least esophageal Crohn's, I do about 30 to 45 seconds. You see that there is good effect with the dilation, things are snug. I feel like I am getting some, some benefit in terms of relief of dysphagia symptoms. After I hold it in for about 30 seconds, then I deflate the balloon and then you'll see some effect. Here, when I blow the balloon down, you see that there have been some mucosal disruptions giving me confidence that I've had some endoscopic efficacy on this patient. This patient gets dilated about once a year because that's the rate at which her symptoms recur. So it's not a one-stop shop at all in terms of strictures. If I can go to the next slide. If I can skip past this slide and go to the next slide, just in interest of time. So this is a video that I'm grateful to Bo Shen for sharing with me. If I was trying this, I would probably be awake for days before and days after attempting this procedure. But this is a needle knife of a duodenal stricture where he's making incisions into the duodenal stricture that hadn't responded to endoscopic dilation. And you see you sort of gradually cut into the fibrotic band of this stricture. Again, this is something that absolutely I would recommend be done by advanced endoscopists who have a lot of experience in doing this, particularly if they have done this before for duodenal or at least Crohn's related strictures. You see that you may have to do it at sort of multiple points in the stricture, not just at one site, but at a few different sites along the circumference of the stricture. And in some patients with refractory strictures, this does seem to work where balloon dilation alone was not sufficient. But balloon dilation would still be the, the first attempt in these patients. So do not try this at home, but with the right experience, there are patients where it, it helps. So I can go to the next slide, please. So sort of take home messages. Upper GI Crohn's disease, particularly isolated, is uncommon, but because of the site and the lack of easy surgical treatment, it can be disabling. It's important to remember that histologic involvement can be frequently seen and may not necessarily represent that disease. Phenotype, it's not clear that histologic involvement alone means anything. An upper GI endoscopy does not need to be routinely done in everybody with Crohn's disease, but in people with symptoms that we saw for the esophageal and gastric, if they have some unexplained symptoms like that, it's worth looking. Medical treatment is similar to that at other sites, often in combination with a proton pump inhibitor, particularly for gastric Crohn's or esophageal Crohn's. And endoscopic therapy is effective in those with stricturing disease, but multiple sessions are required and just one-time dilation is not enough. And thank you for your attention.